Hi, everyone, and welcome to our workshop on the topic of breast sleeping. We're going to be discussing nursing and sleep issues for families with young babies. Uh, my name is Ananda, and I am the director of Boston Doula Circle. We provide doula services, lactation support, and a variety of other offerings in the greater Boston area, as well as our workshops on Zoom, which are open to viewers in any location. So welcome to all of you. I became a certified lactation counselor in the year 2001. So I'm in my 21st year of being a lactation specialist. And I'm so happy that you are here today. I'm also the co-author of the Doula Guide to Birth published by Penguin Random House. And I love talking about the topics that we have on the agenda for today. So we're excited to have this conversation with you. I'm also joined today by my colleague, Carrie, and I'm going to ask Carrie to go ahead and introduce herself right now. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Carrie Babish. I'm also a member of the Boston Doula Circle team. I work as a birth and postpartum doula on the team, as well as as a lactation specialist. Um, to help our clients in that capacity. That's a bit more of a recent addition to my repertoire than Ananda, um, but I've really been enjoying the work a great deal. And I am also a, the mother of three um, who were, all three of mine were um, either completely or primarily breastfed. Um, we, had, we had some combo feeding in our life. So if any questions about that um, come up, I'm happy to talk about my experience there as well. Um, but sleep is one of those things that's so important to new families. We find with our clients that questions of sleep and questions of feeding are always, uh, you know, the first things that we get asked about, especially in the early days. Uh, so I'm just so happy to be able to, you know, have some time to really dive into how those topics are interconnected this morning or this afternoon. And um, we're so happy to have you joining us. Thank you, Carrie. Um, the way we're going to conduct the workshop today is that everyone who's watching live will be muted except for myself and Carrie. Um, but we wanna hear from you. So if you have any questions or comments for us as we go along, um, please drop them into our chat box here on Zoom and we'll answer those questions as we get the chance to do so. And one last housekeeping item is that if we have any major technical difficulties today, for example, if Zoom was to completely crash, um, we would just ask you to hang in there and log back in five minutes later and, and hopefully we could, um, we could keep going at that point. I know there have been a few odd noises in the building that I'm in today, so that, that might happen. We'll see. Um, but again, thank you for, for being here today. And let's start thinking about uh, what our goals are for the workshop. I'd like to start by explaining where the term breast sleeping came from. It is a term that was coined by the Academy of Breastfeeding Medicine, um, which is a fantastic group that approaches breastfeeding from um, an academic and scientific viewpoint. It's, um, it's mostly an organization of physicians who specialize in breastfeeding. And they coined this term uh, to, to point out that the topic of nursing a baby cannot really be entirely separated from the issue of sleep. So um, it, was, it was exciting to, to see this, this new term come, come into use in 2020. And it also refers to the fact that in cultures around the world, people breastfeed their babies while they're sleeping, um, just like all, all other mammals do as well. And 
that was how this, this term came about. For today's purposes, we're going to use the term breast sleeping more broadly. So we'd like to discuss, uh, have a discussion about the various ways that nursing intersects with sleep issues. So we have four items on the agenda for today. Um, these are the main topics we'd like to talk about. Number one is that we'll be talking about um, postpartum and the traditions surrounding the postpartum period, which encourage um, this, this time frame to be a time of rest. And topic number two is that we're going to take a look at the issue of sleep safety. Um, and we're gonna take a, a positive and perhaps a little bit of a new perspective on that topic. Number three, we're going to talk about the, um, the nursing and breastfeeding positions that allow someone to get the most rest. And then number four, we're gonna talk about a lot of other ways to make sure that new parents are actually getting plenty of sleep. And something we've observed, um, I'd like to say this, this workshop is open to families whose babies sleep in a bassinet or a crib, um, as well as families whose babies sleep in the parent's bed. And something we've observed as professionals is that families whose babies sleep in a, a crib sometimes have questions about co-sleeping and families who practice co-sleeping sometimes have questions about how their baby can get to sleep in a crib. So everyone can potentially learn from each other regarding these topics. And that's why we've uh, welcomed everyone to be here together today. And as we get started right now, if you're watching live, I'd like to ask you to go ahead and share in our chat box and let us know what brought you here today. And if, is there a question you'd like to ask um, about nursing and sleep? And if so, feel free to, to let us know what that is and, and let us know who you are and what you're interested in so that we can address that during, during today's workshop. So I'll give, I'll give folks a moment to share your answers in our, our chat box and then we'll keep going. Okay, so let's go ahead and get started with agenda item number one, which was um, traditions of postpartum as a time of rest. And I'll say that as a maternal and child health professional, several years ago, I heard someone express the perspective that postpartum is meant to be a time of rest and recovery. And I fully agree with this. I, I love that description. I love telling that to new parents that it's meant to be a time of rest and recovery. And I'm able to say that my experience, my personal experience of postpartum was a restful one. So I'd like to share a little bit about that with you. Uh, my story is that when I had my baby, my partner and I did not live together. And I was alone with the baby most nights of the week. And even under those circumstances, I was able to get the full rest that I needed. So my partner was present in the early evenings after work and you know during the, the dinner hour helping uh, care for, for the baby. Um, and I also had help from a postpartum doula who came to my home about 10 hours per week. So I didn't, didn't have help full time, um, but those were my main sources of support. And I would describe postpartum as a very intense period where a lot was going on and the baby needed me most of the hours of the day, mainly for nursing. 
So I'd like to distinguish the idea of someone feeling tired as a result of this intense caregiving um, versus feeling sleep deprived because I actually did not feel sleep deprived. Um, and I, the, the way that I was able to um, have this happen was that I did plan ahead for my postpartum. I had the advantage of being, uh, having been a doula for quite a few years before I finally had a baby. So I knew how important it was to, to plan ahead. And I did several of the things that we're gonna be discussing in our, in our workshop. So we're gonna share a lot of options. You do not have to do um, any of them or all of them, but some of them will, uh, you know, I, I did have experience with. And just one, one element of what I did in those first couple of mo months postpartum was that I received visitors, um, you know, friends and family um, while I stayed in my bed. And what I did was I placed a chair next to my bed for whoever was visiting to sit in. And this was my way of reminding myself and reminding others that my job was to rest, to recover, and to breastfeed full time. So I stayed in the bed, visitor, I went to the door, I answered the door to let people in and then I went back to the bed and they sat in the chair next to the bed. And I didn't know it at the time, but this, that was actually a feature of postpartum care in many cultures, um, which is that the nursing parent would stay in bed and visitors would come to greet her in the bedroom. So that was something that I implemented. And across many cultures and throughout history, there has been a tradition of bed rest after childbirth and seclusion. And this is found, um, this has, this is found very, very commonly. So humans in many parts of the world uh, kind of evolved this same approach to postpartum care. Um, and it commonly lasted for, for about one full month and sometimes longer, but that was the common thread that postpartum was seen as a time of rest for at least one full month. And this was understood as part of the culture. The goal of postpartum um, in these scenarios was to release the mother from household chores and for her to rest and for her to learn to breastfeed. So that was understood. Um, and so the term that we, that was actually was used here in the United States came um, from, from Europe and in European history, this tradition was called lying in. And, that, and then that term was brought here to the United States. Um, here in the Boston area, our largest maternity hospital is, it's uh, currently called Brigham and Women's Hospital. But up until 1966, which is only about two generations ago, it was called Boston Lying In Hospital. And it had that name for um, about a hundred years. Um, I have a friend who's about my age and she was born there when it was still called Boston Lying In Hospital. So this is you know, within our memory. And the, the name of the hospital tells us that there was probably the expectation that um, new mothers would stay in the hospital to rest, perhaps for a couple of weeks. So that's the, that was the definition of a lying in hospital. So, so we can take a look at um, some of the parts of the world where this, this tradition could be found in some places. It, it can still be found as an active tradition, but not, not really here in the US. Um, and these are some of the names that have been given to this tradition um, all around the world. And they, they have a lot of similarities to them. Um, they often re refer to a period of about 40 days. And in, so in some of these countries, um, the name of this tradition, for example, in India and Pakistan, where it's called five weeks, 
the in in the languages that are used um, in that part of the world, that would that would translate uh, the you know the term that's used for this practice would translate into into English as five weeks. So again, really can be found um, fairly fairly universally around the world. And something that I, I mentioned um, a few moments ago was that nursing a newborn baby is a full-time job. And it can be helpful to, to calculate the, the hours that are involved in that job. And some of you may have experienced this um, as a new parent yourself or as a professional who works with new parents, and some of you might might currently be pregnant. Um, you, you might not have experienced this yet, but let's take a look at the amount of time spent feeding a baby. That's the activity that new parents are going to spend the most time doing. And newborns need to eat very frequently. Uh, we usually see them eating somewhere between 10 to 15 times in a 24 hour period. And in the early weeks of a baby's life, those feedings are fairly long. They get shorter as the baby grows a little bit older, but in the first one to two months of life, those uh, it's normal for the feeding sessions to be 30 to 40 minutes each. So if we do the if we do this the, the math we do this calculation I'm actually going to ask if folks in our audience could go ahead and do the math for us and uh, whoever is the you know first or second person to to get the answer if you could if you could drop that into our our chat box you know let's look at this um, realistically it's 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 quite quite a few hours of the day. Um, and it can be it can be done just like any just like any um, full time occupation can be done in a in a comfortable way. But we um, we want to talk openly about um, the amount of time that this really does add up to be. So let's think about. Uh, what the messages are in our modern society here in the U.S. We, we sometimes have viewers outside of the U.S. Um, feel free to chime in if you'd like to. But here in the U.S., let's think about what the messages are of what postpartum should be like um, in our modern society. Is it a time of rest and recovery? Do we recognize that learning to breastfeed is the main job that new parents will be spending hours of their time doing? Um, and do we provide the support for this to happen? And the answer there, unfortunately, is no. Um, there are a lot of messages about new parenthood in our society, but we've almost entirely lost the message that it is meant to be a time of rest and recovery, which was acknowledged up until just a few generations ago. The message that we do have is that postpartum is meant to be a time of sleep deprivation and suffering for the new parents. We're also supposed to accept this as normal and that this is just the way things are. But this is, this is a message for, that can set people up for an unhappy postpartum that can actually sometimes even be harmful um, to their physical health and their mental health when we um, forget the, the idea that it's actually meant to be a time of, of rest and recovery. And fortunately, there are ways that we can reverse this message and we're gonna talk more about that uh, later in our workshop today. So right now we, we often include a guided meditation in our workshop. Um, and this is part of our mind body approach to nursing and parenting. And in just a moment, we're gonna be doing a meditation together and you can do this with us wherever you are right now. 
So if you're holding your baby, um, you can continue to do so. But if, you're, if, if your baby is in a, a sleep and in a, a crib or with someone else, you can just sit quietly by yourself. Um, you don't need to pick up your baby if you're not already holding them, even though uh, in previous workshops, we've, we've asked you to pick up your baby. T today, you can just sit with or without your baby in your arms. And we're gonna, we're gonna start our meditation and you, uh, your eyes can be closed or open for this, whichever is more relaxing to you. So let's get started. Um, if you're the parent of a baby, or if you've spent time around babies, think back to the first time you met a particular baby in your life. The first time you held your baby, did you do so in a careful and sensitive way? See if you can remember those moments of learning to hold a baby for the first time. Were you amazed by the magic of it? Were you nervous about doing it right? After a few minutes, were you able to relax a bit more and to feel more comfortable holding the baby? Now think about how it felt after you'd had the opportunity to get more experience holding babies. Maybe this is the feeling you had after your own baby was a couple weeks old, or maybe this was after you'd gotten to know other babies in your life and you'd had the chance to hold them quite a few times. Think about how your confidence may have grown around this simple activity of holding a baby. And now think about your experience of getting to know your baby and her behaviors. Think about the movements your baby makes and the expressions you see on her face. Think about the different kinds of sounds that she makes, which are her own unique sounds, sounds that are not exactly the same as any other baby. Even though this being is smaller than you, Think about the ways in which you can tell that she is strong in her very own way. What are the things that let you know your baby is strong? Is it the way your baby pushes firmly with her legs on your lap in order to move herself closer to your breast? Think about the strength in her legs. When you are nursing, if you try to move your baby's arms away, does she start to arm wrestle you with her full strength? Think about the strength in your baby's arms. Does your baby grab onto your finger with her hand or pinch your skin? Think about the strength in her hands. How about the strength of your baby's suck? When you nurse, can you feel how strongly he sucks on your nipples? If you place your finger into your baby's mouth, can you feel the strength of his suck? Think about how strong all those muscles are in his face, which allow him to suck. What have you noticed about the strength of your baby's neck? Can you tell that each day it gets a little stronger and that he can hold up his head with his own neck strength more and more. When your baby is swaddled, does he sometimes break out of the swaddle blanket? Think about the strength in his body that allows him to do that. Does your baby have a loud, strong cry? When your baby cries, is it sometimes because he is hungry? Is it sometimes because he is overtired? Is it sometimes because he's been laid down, but he doesn't want to be left by himself? Is it sometimes because he needs to be bounced and moved around? Because lying still doesn't feel good to him for hours on end. Think about how much you've learned about what your baby's cries mean and how to respond to them. You and your baby know how to communicate with each other. Think about the fact that there are so many ways in which you are a good parent 
or in which you will be a good parent if you bring a baby into your life someday. You and your baby mirror each other's brain waves and you mirror each other's expressions. You've noticed so many tiny details about how your baby looks and behaves down to your baby's tiniest movements and noises. After your baby's first week at home with you, you will have gotten to know your baby better than anyone else in the world. And you will be the person who continues to have the deepest knowledge of your baby. Honor yourself for this special closeness you have with your baby. And now we will finish up this meditation. You can open your eyes if they've been closed and let yourself come back to the moment in the room that you are in. Okay. And so now we're gonna look at agenda item number two for today, which is a positive perspective on sleep safety. And what we did during that meditation was to allow ourselves to feel some confidence in our ability to take care of our babies and to keep them safe. We also thought about the fact that our babies are growing stronger and sturdier day by day. And we can see that just by looking at them. We were using mindfulness to start to approach the idea of safety. This can be helpful when we think, uh, when we go back to thinking about the messages in our society about postpartum. It can feel a bit blunt to say this, but one of the main ways our society tends to look at the topic of infant sleep is through the lens of death. And by that, I mean the very, very low possibility that a baby could die while asleep. And something we can do during our time together today is to ask, uh, is that the most constructive way to approach our baby's sleep, um, i.e. through the lens of death? Or could we find a healthier balance where we have an awareness of safety without also causing new parents to feel severely anxious. So that's something we're gonna to try to do today is to find that balance. And safety is important. I want to acknowledge that. I'm somebody who paid a professional child proofer, uh, almost $1,000 to child proof the very, very small condo that I live in. Um, so I know that safety is important and we are not in any way critical of parents who are concerned about their baby's safety. Um, as maternal and child health professionals, what we do hope for is that new parents will have the chance to truly love the experience of nursing. We hope you will be fully rested and that you will have good mental health without severe anxiety about keeping your baby safe. And all of those things are possible. So that's going to be our approach uh, to safety. And let's talk about how those things can be possible. And I'm gonna ask um, Carrie to, to speak now. Thank you, Ananda. Everybody really enjoyed the meditation and we were asked if we might be able to share it um, later, which I think should we should be able to to do um i just want to take a quick moment before we we launch into this next section on safety to acknowledge something about our, our discussion of like lying in um that's something i i had sort of a modified lying in period with my third baby um where i spent most of the first two weeks in bed um and it was a it was an amazing change from my experience with my first two, and I highly recommend it. But we also recognize that it is a privileged position to be able to spend that kind of dedicated time in our culture, unfortunately. Um, so we just want to acknowledge that like that is not 
a full lying in is not something that everyone can or necessarily wants to do, but the things we're going to talk about today are going to help you to maximize the rest that you're getting, regardless of, of how much of that that more traditional lying in you're able to have in your own experience. Um, I also just want to um, say before we get started that our goal today is not to advocate for one particular um, way of sleeping and having your baby sleep. Um, it is really to ensure that however families are sleeping and having their babies sleep, that it's done as safely as possible. Um, and we, we want to make sure that um, that everyone feels seen and heard um, in, in this process. Um, I myself, um, when I had my first baby 11 and a half years ago, um, I had done a lot of research into everything. I, at the time I was a middle school teacher. I, I'm, I'm a lifelong learner. I'm one of those people who read everything I could find. Um, and most of what I was finding said that there was one safe way to sleep with your baby. And that was to have them on a separate sleep surface, um, exclusively, um, on their back. And, um, that was pretty much it. Um, there was an acknowledgement that it was good to have the baby in the room with you in the early days, um, either in a crib or bassinet in the room or in, um, a co-sleeper attached to the bed. And that was, that was what I started with. I started out with this, um, sidecar co-sleeper. Co Some of you may have heard of the arms reach co-sleeper, which was one of the first, first ones. Although now we have all kinds of them out there. Um, and that was my plan to have the baby sleep in the co-sleeper so that I could reach her when I needed to, and then put her back, um, into the co-sleeper. And what I discovered was that most of the time that worked absolutely fine. And other times I would bring the baby into the bed to nurse and then fall asleep because as a new parent, we are tired. Um, our goal is to help you not be exhausted, but we're all going to be tired and nursing actually brings on sleep for the baby as well as for the nursing parent. It creates hormones in our body that, that encourage sleep. Um, so I would find myself falling asleep with the baby in the bed. And I was very anxious about it because the messaging I had received was that this was not a safe choice ever. Um, but the researcher in me, um, you know, went back, back into, into research mode. And I discovered that that was not the end of the story. Um, and that there was research into how to bed share safely. Um, and one of the biggest resources out there for this um, is something called the Safe Sleep 7. And uh, we're very fortunate that a group of nationally known and very experienced lactation consultants created a set of guidelines called the Safe Sleep 7. Um, and these experts evaluated all the existing research around um, co-sleeping, particularly um, in the form of bed sharing, um, and made it available to the public. Um, the Safe Sleep 7 was developed initially around this idea of co-sleeping, um, but it really, most of these ideas are relevant to families regardless of, of where their babies are sleeping, in cribs, in bassinets, um, with the adults in their, in their bed, or in any other location. Um, and so you can see on the screen right now, these are the, the safe sleep seven, and it comes from the book, sweet sleep. Um, and basically it says that if you are a non-smoker sober and unimpaired, so not on any kind of medication that, um, would, lead to a, a deeper than normal sleep. Um, and if you are a nursing parent um, and your baby is healthy and full term on his or her back when not nursing and lightly dressed and you're both on a safe surface, um, then that is a recipe for safe sleep. And um, we'll talk a little bit more about what each of these looks like, particularly like what is a safe 
sleep surface. Um, and if you can say yes to those seven items, these experts found that we eliminate all the major risk factors for babies during their, their sleep. Um, now the American of Academy of Pediatrics guidelines um, includes all of these same recommendations with the exception that the AAP currently recommends against bed sharing in its guidelines for parents. Um, if we look a little deeper at the, the AAP policy statement on infant sleep, we see that there's some complexity and nuance to the issue. Um, the full policy statement is directed at doctors and is about um, 23 pages long. Um, and one of the statements in the full AAP document is, um, and this is a quote, the AAP acknowledges that parents frequently fall asleep while feeding the, the infant, end quote. <laughs> um, they acknowledge it and then that's kind of it. Um, the full AAP document goes on to address the fact that in most accidents involving an infant in bed with an adult, there has been a combination of other serious risk factors. Um, these are the same risk factors that we saw described in the Safe Sleep 7, such as smoking, um, having a, an exclusively formula-fed um, infant in the bed, having a premature baby, or the baby being face down. So we see from the research that the adult bed is not the risk in itself. Um, it's a combination of factors along with being on the same surface. Um, so when we can eliminate those other risk factors, um, we're increasing the safety. Um, it might be helpful to put the risk of bed sharing into perspective. So we're gonna take a look at um, some actual statistics right now. Um, so you can see here that it says that a baby's chance of being hit by lightning, which is everyone's favorite random event, is one in 13,000. And a baby's chance of dying while bed sharing in the absence of these hazards that we've mentioned is one in 16,400. So, um, you know, if we, if we think of being hit by lightning as that completely random chance unlikely event, the chance of a baby dying while doing safe bed sharing is significantly lower than that. Um, so we're gonna talk a little bit more, as I mentioned about the topic of what is a sleep, safe sleep surface. That's hard to say. <laughs> um, whether a family is crib sleeping or co-sleeping. Um, this was the last item in the safe sleep seven. Um, and a safe sleep surface is first and foremost, a firm mattress, whether that is a, a crib mattress, a bassinet mattress, um, or a full-sized um, bed mattress. Um, it, we don't want to have it be um, a very soft mattress or have any kind of like a pillow top or anything like that. Um, and the second thing, which we, you know, we hear always, um, when babies are put into cribs or bassinets that there should not be any soft bedding in there with them, whether it's pillows, blankets, um, crib bumpers, things like that. Um, and that's true regardless of, of the surface. Now that does not mean that if you have your baby sleeping with you in your bed, that you can't have any pillows or blankets, but it is very important to keep them away from the baby's face. Um, so pillow, we, we would recommend only one pillow for the, the parent and for it to be kept, you know, up high. You can even have one arm kind of tucked up underneath to keep it underneath your head and any bedding to be kept um, to waist level or lower so that we're creating this open space where there is not any loose bedding around the baby. Um, and again, if they are in a crib or a bassinet, that means we're not putting in any of those items that we mentioned earlier. A safe sleep surface is not a sofa. Um, this is listed as an extraordinarily high risk surface by the American Academy of Pediatrics, um, and also something like um, an armchair, particularly a recliner. We see a lot of people, um, a lot of um, like nursery chairs these days are these fancy recliners. Um, 
And th they're a great place to nurse, but they are not a safe place to fall asleep with your baby. Um, another element of safe sleep surfaces includes swaddling. And swaddling can be safe depending on the kind of sleep that you are doing. So if your baby is sleeping in a crib or in a bassinet, um, a swaddle is a lifesaver in the early days. It is extremely helpful to help a baby sleep for a longer period of time uninterrupted in a crib. And we'll talk more about this a little further on. Um, however, it is not used should not be used for co-sleeping. Um, we want the baby to have full access to their arms. Ananda in her meditation talked about the strength of baby's arms. So it helps them to reposition themselves if they need to. Um, and it's also beneficial um, to help them to um, get situated for breastfeeding. Um, I like, um, if you are someone who like me did a combination of um, of crib sleeping or, or independent sleeping and um, co-sleeping or bed sharing, I like a zipper swaddle because if the baby is on a separate surface and you're bringing them into the bed, you just unzipper that swaddle, bring them to you. And if you're returning them to a separate surface at some point later in the night, you just zip them back up again. That's a little, that's not in our, our outline, but that's my pro tip right there. Um, and the U S um, has a public health message, which is not really found anywhere else in the world. The message to mm -hmm. never sleep with your baby, um, by having that as our general public health message, we're missing out on at least two important pieces of guidance for parents, um, which is if we do end up bed sharing, which we find happens for a lot of parents, whether they plan to do it or not, how can it be done safely? And if we have a baby who is primarily or exclusively crib or bassinet sleeping, how do you actually get babies to sleep there? Um, they, they don't always naturally want to sleep on a separate flat surface. So how do we help them to do that and really ensure that everyone's getting the most um, efficient um, amount of sleep that they can. Um, we're also going to talk a little bit more later about the idea of what if you cannot currently meet the safe sleep seven recommendations. Many of these things can be helped or resolved with um, the help of, of different professionals um, that can help to in increase the safety of your sleep and help modify things for you. We are also going to talk about, you know, what does it what does it look like um, to have a baby exclusively sleeping in a separate surface um, if if you just want that or if you are not able to modify those safe sleep seven recommendations enough. So um, again, we want to make sure that everyone is uh, getting the information and support they need. So we we will talk more about that later. Um, we are, we're going to come up on a, a quick break in a few minutes, but to close out this section, I just want to say that for parents who decide to bed share or who accidentally fall asleep with their babies, which is the majority of parents at some point, um, we, we have not as a culture given them information about how to bed share safely. And for parents whose babies sleep in a bassinet or crib, we haven't really given them the information on how to get their babies to go to sleep successfully, um, which can be difficult. Um, so when we come back from that break, we're gonna talk more about each of these questions um, and share some possible answers uh, to them. Um, so we're gonna stop here. We're gonna take about a five minute break. Ananda, do you wanna, let everybody know when they can come back to us. Sure. Let's see. I, I have 1245 on my screen. Let's come back at 1250. I, I saw that a question that appeared several times in our chat um, was people mentioning that they um, their babies are waking up very frequently. 
during the night to, to rest. And that I think several people mentioned that that was happening during co-sleeping. Um, so I'd, I'd like to find a way, maybe Carrie, you and I can think about some, some answers um, to that particular question. The, the, the answers, one, one answer I will share about that is that some of you mentioned that your babies were a bit beyond the newborn stage and maybe later in, into the first year of life. And then now baby is waking up even more. And one thing I'd like to mention is that that can be um, a biologically normal part of baby's development. So it's not linear. It's not that babies sleep more and more and more um, at each progressive age. They actually can have, um, they, can, they can return to waking up at night um, in the later part of the first year of life, but it's temporary. It doesn't mean that they've suddenly lost all ability. It just may mean that they're going through a phase developmentally where um, chemical levels are changing in their body, growth spurts are happening, and it, there's there actually might be something protective about the fact that they're waking up a bit more frequently, but that it doesn't mean that they, they um, permanently reversed themselves. It means that they're going through a new phase that can actually be biologically expected. Um, so just to wanna to normalize that, but how can you deal with it? Um, we'll try to talk a little bit more about that as well. And I'd like to share one more screen during our break, um, which is to let you know what some of the resources are um, that you might find of interest on these topics of postpartum, um, postpartum rest as well as sleep safety. And these are some of the resources we use for our presentation. Um, so I just wanted to put that up there. Um, although I'm going to take it off for just a moment and, and pause our recording. Okay, let's get started again. I uh, noticed a few questions in our chat box that I'd like to see if we can try to, to help you get answered and then we'll go on with the agenda that we have for you. Um, one of the questions I, I saw said, is it okay to let a newborn baby just sleep? And the answer to that is yes. From the perspective of the lactation profession, we are looking for a newborn baby to eat a minimum of eight times in a 24 hour period. So if, if those eight times are happening, it does not matter so much when they are happening. And if a baby has a longer stretch of sleep, um, that's, that's fine. We usually say one stretch of up to five hours in a 24 hour period um, of a, 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 longer, a longer stretch of sleep. And if we did that more than once per day, we wouldn't really be able to get in that minimum of eight times per day. Um, so we're trying to find that balance, a minimum of eight times per day when babies drop down when newborn babies drop down to seven feedings per day or fewer, those babies gradually start to lose weight. So we're looking for a minimum of eight, but yes, you can let a baby sleep. If you're getting to the end of 24 hours, there have not been eight feedings, then you would wake a baby up, but, um, but otherwise you can, you can let babies sleep. Um, and Ananda, could you clarify maybe for folks who aren't certain, like what period of the baby's life are we talking about where that's, that's appropriate? And at what point is it okay to let them start sleeping a bit longer if they would like to sleep a little longer than that five hour um, stretch? That's a good question. Um, I'm not sure if I can answer that exactly, but what I'll say again, from the perspective of the lactation perspective is that the eight times per day goes on until the baby is at about 10 weeks of life. So then we can see it drop down to seven and that's gonna give us longer stretches. Um, and my understanding is that the sleep, sleep training methods that have evolved and that, <clears throat> excuse me, um, were developed by doctors and sleep scientists pretty universally say uh, not to um, start, start formal sleep training programs before four months of life. 
Um, but there may be some babies who naturally have a long stretch um, here and here and there. So we just don't want to. And and in today's workshop, we're we, we're not going to um, address this in detail. We're hoping to talk about this more at a future workshop. But a, 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 quite a few new sleep training programs have emerged, which are focused on the early weeks. So so. Up until recently, the, the phrase sleep training referred to that period uh, beyond four months of life. And now we're seeing quite a few uh, programs, um, some of which have been designed by parents based on their, really based only on their own personal experience. And they're often based on um, bottle feeding, they're not appropriate for breastfeeding families, and they're often based on the idea that by, fill, by overly filling up a baby's stomach with bottle feeding, the baby will sleep longer. So that's really not, it's not really appropriate for anyone, breastfed or, or bottle fed, to, to cause a baby to, to go into um, an unnaturally deep and extended sleep. Um, so we'll try to talk about that more at another time, and um, I hope I was helpful. I, 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 I kind of generally talked about the the ages, um, although I wasn't able to be. Yeah, no, I think that's very helpful, and I just know, like for me, I remember with my first, I had the the you know they tell you at the hospital, you know, wake the baby every you know couple of hours to make sure they're eating. No one ever told me when to stop doing that, like what to look for to know when to stop. Um, so I did it much longer than I actually needed to. So I think just even basic guidelines like that are super helpful for folks. So thank you, Ananda. Okay. Yeah. And yeah, in terms of, and Carrie, you had a baby who was, um, you know, if your, if your baby was a sleepier baby, that's a little bit less common. It's totally within the realm of normal. You know, more commonly, we're going to see babies who wake, who wake up whenever they need to eat. Um, but occasionally we see babies who are a little sleepier and it lasts for a few weeks and not months. Yeah. Um, so another question someone had was, how can I tell if my baby is getting enough milk while nursing if I am asleep, if, the, if they're nursing in their sleep? So it's, we can tell because... It's the same way we can tell that babies are getting enough milk when they're nursing during the daytime. Uh, even if we are asleep to, to, to what's happening, um, the ba babies have the most amazing um, self-regulation capabilities when it comes to their intake. Um, they, they know when they're hungry, they know when to stop, they know when they've reached satiation. They also know when they have um, taken in enough milk fat. So breast milk is made of different components, water, carbohydrates, protein, and fat. And the, baby, um, the baby's body knows when it has taken in the amount of fat and calories that it needs. Even if everybody's asleep, it's the same function as what happens when we are awake. Um, so that is not something to worry about. It's interesting that term breast sleeping that we talked about in the beginning, there's a, a bit of a longer definition to it that the Academy of Breastfeeding Medicine came up with. And the longer definition says something like, um, it's, you know, it's, it's common for people to breastfeed in their sleep. And in the morning, the, the nursing, the parent will report that they don't recall how often they breastfed during the night or for how long. And I, I think that's actually, it just puts a smile on my face, you know, that it, it, it happens throughout the night. People don't report knowing. And just like a hundred years ago and for almost all of human history before we had bottles with um, measurements on, on them, we never, ever, ever, ever knew what the exact amount was, but the babies did the self-regulating. Um, and then there was the question of, for folks who are finding that when their babies are close to them during the night, um, some people said, particularly with co-sleeping and they're 
they're nursing more, um, there's getting to be too many wake-ups. Um, so I'm gonna try to offer a few comments on that. Carrie, if you have any others, you can, you can chime in as well. Um, one thing is gonna be to um, just take a look at what you're, what you're wearing. <laughs> um, you know, you can wear a, a shirt that you can fully pull down over yourself and kind of keep that, that boundary and that barrier between you and the baby rather than having um, a shirt that's always flapped open. Um, and I think the way I would respond to that situation would, would be, I'm gonna use the word persistence so that if a baby um, wakes up and nuzzles the breast and st starts to latch on, um, they're not necessarily drinking milk. So comfort sucking is also normal and natural and babies need to do it. However, um, as the parent, you know, you can, you'll be working on that parent baby communication. Um, and you'll be, you will be setting some of your own limits and it's hard to do when the other person doesn't use words, <laughs> you know, you're dealing with this little person who doesn't speak yet. Um, but let's, I want to acknowledge that if, if you're in bed with the baby for eight hours, the baby is not drinking for eight hours. If they're, if they're seeking out the breast, it's not eight hours of drinking. It's, it's, uh, that's. I don't, I don't believe it's, it's actually that situation could be possible too, but I think that what people experience more um, commonly is that comfort sucking is happening during the night, nutritive sucking is happening during the night, but nursing is still happening all day long as well. So we're not, uh, you know, it's that comfort sucking that it's, it's okay to remove the baby for that if he can't sleep. And then it involves finding other ways to put the baby to sleep. It might involve temporarily sitting up, um, rocking the baby, walking the baby around, settling the baby down. I would offer a pinky finger. I would put my pinky finger, if you, if, if you wanna try not having to get out of bed, start with a pinky finger in the baby's mouth, the soft side up, insert that into the mouth and let the baby suck and fall back to sleep. Um, so you can, you can break that association of the breast always being in the mouth. Um, but it, persistence is really involved because I think what I've observed with so many families is that when they do, um, try to introduce some kind of sleep conditioning, if it doesn't work the first time, it can feel like it failed. And if it doesn't work the second time, it can feel like it failed, but these changes usually take a full week. So any, any changes involved with feeding or sleeping often, I always say, give it a full week. It's a multi-day process. It's if it doesn't work the first night and there is, there is, you know, crying involved or frustration, um, it's, you're actually on your way. <laughs> so we want to see you get to night two and night three and night four and hang in there and be very persistent and be very consistent. Offer the finger to suck on every time, you know, get up and rock the baby every time if that's what works until you can, until then you can stay laying down and, um, you know, rock and pat the baby and do that consistently, but be consistent with it and don't feel like it has failed. Yeah. And I, I would just add, um, you know, I think that question came from Amy and she, she had a little bit of a slightly different question, um, because her, her baby, it sounds like is not necessarily trying to comfort suck, but is, is rooting and then getting to the nipple. And that's actually not what they're looking for. That's not, they're not looking to nurse either for nutrition or for comfort, but it is, it is the baby's instinct. It's their instinct is to go for sucking because it is the one way that they really have to soothe themselves. Um, obviously they need our bodies for it, but they don't need any action from us. Um, so it's going to be the, the first thing that they go to, even if it's not actually what they want in that moment. Um, so in, in that kind of situation, if you have a, a partner or another adult um, in, the, in the home, um, letting them take the baby to soothe them um, outside of the bed, 
I think can be helpful. Sometimes I always say it's tough to smell like mom or smell like the nursing parent because the baby's going to smell milk, even sometimes, you know, depending on what you're wearing through the clothes. Um, so just having a little bit of distance. And if, if not, um, if there isn't somebody else there to support you in that way, getting into a slightly more upright position, whether it's sitting or standing as a non-dimensioned, um, you know, it can feel hard to do that in the moment, but hopefully with that consistency, it's not a long-term um, thing that you'll need to do forever. Um, and the other thing I would say, something that worked for me when I reached a point where um, bed sharing all night, you know, as babies get a little bigger, they, they get a little more active and you're just like, <laughs> I can't sleep. Um, and that's the opposite of what we want. So um, another thing that you can do is if there is a point in the night where either the baby is sleeping longer or um, has traditionally slept longer, even if they've gotten into this, this period of, of more frequent wake-ups, um, you can try swaddling them and putting them down to sleep in a bassinet or a crib. Probably they're sleeping that way sometimes during the day, even if you're exclusively um, bed sharing at night. So hopefully they, they have some experience there. And then you can bring the baby back into the bed with you once they've had their first wake up, um, that then maybe they'll be less likely to be woken by that, that smell of the milk, um, and be able to sleep a little bit longer, let you sleep a little bit longer before returning to, um, to the thing, which it sounds like Amy in your case has been working. So perhaps with like a little bit of a break overnight, it can continue to work something else to try. All right. Thank you, Carrie. So now let's uh, do please continue to ask questions um, if you'd like to in the chat. And now let's talk about um, agenda item number three for today, which is positions for nursing, which are the most restful. And everyone working in the field of maternal and child health recognizes that uh, being able to nurse while lying down um, is a can be very helpful. The American Academy of Pediatrics is on board with this, as is every other um, professional organization. Um, and being able to nurse lying down is by far the position that is going to give someone the most rest. And there are a couple of ways, a uh, few different ways to go about this. Um, so some techniques for getting into position for, for laying down, uh, there's a few different options here. The, the first one is that you can just start by laying down on your side and you would position the baby so that the baby is lying on her side and the baby and the parent are facing each other. They're parallel to each other. The baby's mouth, um, oh, and actually I'll say it's the, 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 the breast that is closest to the mattress, um, as you can see here, is the one that the baby will be nursing from. And the baby's mouth will be at about the same level as the nipple. So we wanna be sure that the mouth is not, um, really like I say overshooting the nipple that the baby's face is moved so far up above the nipple that the baby that you if you felt like you had to lift the breast toward the baby um, let's not do that let's actually move the baby's entire body so that the baby's um, mouth and nose are lined up with the nipple and then what this parent would do um, is just snuggle the baby a little bit more closely and tightly and um, help the, the baby and the parent um, make contact with their bellies. Um, and we would expect the baby to, to latch on. So this is something you can, um, you can teach yourself how to do or that a, a lactation um, specialist could, could help you with as well. So that was, that's the first technique is just 
the parent lies down first, lie down the baby and um, pull the baby in very close and snug. And that closeness will prompt the baby to latch. Um, number two, another technique would be to, um, if, if someone was finding that they, they're, lying, they're lying down and they can't quite figure it out, they could actually start by sitting up and nursing in their normal position on the bed. And while the baby is attached, the parent could kind of gently move into um, the position of lying on their side with the baby attached to them, and then kind of help adjust the baby's position um, a bit so that everyone's comfortable. Um, and then option number three would also be to start by sitting up nursing in your normal position. And instead of laying on the side, the nursing person would just lay back. So they could semi-recline, they could be at a 45 degree angle, or they could be um, more flat on their back and just keep the baby lying over them um, on, on top of them. So I'll also show a picture of that in just a moment. Um, why don't I go ahead and do that now? So here we see a baby um, on the left-hand picture who's in a bit more of a sideline position. The baby is entirely on his side and he's able to, to latch on and the parent and baby are both lying down and resting. In the picture on the right side, we see that the baby um, or the, the, the parent between the two of them, they, they got the baby uh, um, laying a little bit more on top of uh, the parent facing a bit into a bit more of a downward position, but it was just a bit of a rollover. The, the parent rolled over a bit more onto her back and the, the baby came with her and they can, they can nurse um, happily like this. So very restful. If we're thinking about 10 to 15 times a day, um, it would, it's, it's so nice and important for that time to be spent in a resting, position. Um, that's, it's, it's, it needs to happen many hours of the day. So let's incorporate rest um, into the, the act of feeding. Um, and I want to mention just what, what time of day might you, you know, might somebody do this? It could be done at any time of day. Um, it might, someone might feel more comfortable starting out by doing it during daylight hours so that, that the, the nursing person can see what's going on and learn to get comfortable lying down and also have, be aware of the, the sleep environment and you know, blankets being, um, being, being pushed away. A lot of us have you know, big piles, or, or I should say many layers of blankets on our bed or big piles of laundry. <laughs> And so just getting into the habit of moving those things away um, from the baby's, baby's face, start out during the day so you can get this practice. Um, if another adult, if a support person can be home with you, they can come to check on you. If that helps you to feel more safe and secure, they can check that you're following the safe sleep seven in that environment, in the event that you were to fall asleep, have your partner um, or, um, your support person just check in on you until you get familiar with this. Once you're comfortable nursing lying down, you might decide to do it on your own. And if you do fall asleep with your baby, but you prefer not to co-sleep, then when you awaken and you realize you've fallen asleep, which won't usually take, uh, take too long, you won't be there, um, you know, all day and all night, you will awaken at some point, then you would just put the baby back into the crib at that time and, um, and go back to, to sleep. If you, if you fell asleep unintentionally and you prefer not to co-sleep, when you wake up, we just put the baby back in the crib. And if you do prefer to co-sleep, then you would simply stay where you are and continue to follow the guidelines of the safe sleep seven. Um, so I'm going to show a few, a couple more pictures here of nursing lying down. And many 
uh, many of us haven't had the opportunity to see what this looks like. What does it look like to nurse lying down? Um, so we're gonna show a few pictures of that. And actually this first one that comes up, um, I'm gonna kind of correct what I just said. This, this is a, a little illustration. It's a, bit, it's a bit hard to see here, but there's a, a, a parent lying down, um, a breastfeeding parent with the, the baby right next to her, but they're actually not nursing in this moment. Um, so this could be a, it could be a nursing position or it could be a co-sleeping position. I, where this comes from, this is from a pamphlet um, that was produced in the UK. And the name of the, the pamphlet is called Where Might My Baby Sleep? And it's a, or a booklet and it's each page has shows the baby in a different sleeping location. So in one location, the baby is in its own room. In another location, the baby is in a crib next to the parent's bed. In this location, the baby is in the, in the parent's bed. And then there's a, a picture of a baby and a parent on a, on a sofa, which everyone is agree, in agreement with. That is the riskiest place to fall asleep with a baby. So no sofas, but let's look at this. Um, what's interesting to me is that we were talking about the public health messages earlier. So in the United States, our public health message is um, never sleep with the baby, but in the UK and in many other parts of the world, um, this is the public health message that can be found, which is to acknowledge that people fall asleep with their babies very, very commonly. And so let's actually talk about it. So this brochure was created um, at Durham University and it was produced in collaboration with the National Health Service, uh, which is the, the healthcare system of the UK actually puts out this message. And one thing that's interesting about this brochure um, about two thirds of the way down, it says in the UK, approximately 50% of all babies under three months and 75% of breastfed babies will have shared a bed with their parents, whether intentionally or accidentally. The statistics are very, very, very similar in the United States. Um, about two thirds of parents fall asleep with their babies. So it's, there, there is a, a school of thought that says it's very important to us to actually talk about this rather than just say never do it because we know that at least two thirds of us are gonna fall asleep whether we whether we plan to or not. Um, but again, so pictures of um, of nursing lying down. This is a fine art painting that was done in the year 1906 by the painter Paula Moderson Becker, and she was a young um, artist in Germany. Um, and what's interesting about this picture, which is under over 100 years old, is that you see the same elements of side lying that um, have been studied in, in a more modern context. So researchers who um, have actually created laboratories, uh, like the one on the previous page was actually associated with the laboratory. And then Carrie had mentioned the mother baby sleep laboratory at the University of Notre Dame here in the, the US. Um, those, when babies have been studied either in laboratories or in their natural habitat of the home, we see this same positioning happening over and over again. And it's, we've come to call it the C position. Um, so it's like the, the letter C where the, 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 um, the mother's arm forms the top of the C and her legs from the bottom of the C. She actually creates this um, protected space um, with her own body and the baby sleeps in that space. And when that is done, the baby cannot really move um, above the mother's arm or below the mother's legs. And because they're both um, right now with the mother, they're both kind of in a fetal position with the mother um, having her knees bent like this, she's not, it's not possible for the parent to roll over like a log. Um, and that's, you know, that can be um, the fear is that a parent will roll over, but it's not possible. And this is the, the, the classic position that scientists have observed that this, you know, that painters have painted. Um, there is, there is a, a built in um, area of protection with the parent's body in this C-shaped position. So we'll see that over and over if we were to look at other pictures. And one last picture I wanna share is this one here. 
Um, this is a drawing by Picasso. And the date here is 1952. And it's in his style of cubism, <laughs> so everything is distorted. Um, but what's so interesting when I look at this is that you can still see that the, the, the adult has her knees bent and she's got her upper arm um, coming around the baby in that C shape. So even in this cubist style <laughs> of drawing where it's hard to figure out what's what, we still see that protective shape that parents, a nursing parent automatically takes on with their body and which we have come to understand is protective and it provide, it creates a safe space for the baby. Um, what I'll also say about nursing lying down um, is that these last few, these last few images, the, the parents and the babies are undressed. Um, it's fine to wear clothing. If it's a cooler time of year, uh, you can, the parent could wear long sleeves and then just, and the baby could also wear long sleeves and just keep the, any blankets and sheets down to the waist level of the adult. And that will turn out to also be the waist level of the baby and the, the sheets and blankets will not be anywhere near the baby's face. And that allows us to abide the safe sleep seven. And so now I'm going to ask Carrie to speak again. You may, uh, you may have noticed that you recognized the folks in those first uh, photos that Ananda showed. That was me nursing my youngest who just came for a brief visit to, to nurse. Um, so uh, he wanted to make sure everybody Everybody got to see him in action. Um, we had a couple of questions that um, came up in the chat that I wanted to address really quickly um, before going to the um, topic of ways to get sleep. Um, the first one was um, Lauren said, my baby often falls asleep in that first position, the where the baby is up on their side to nurse. Um, and then wakes when I try to put him on his back, which means it's not safe sleep seven compatible. I would encourage you the next time that that happens, sometimes moving very quickly to put the baby on their back can be, um, you know, can be disruptive to, to the baby. I'd encourage you to take a little time to just observe what happens. Um, if you leave the baby be after they've finished nursing, because I think there's a very good chance that what you'll find is that as they fall more deeply into sleep, they will kind of roll away a bit from the nipple and it will feel more natural for them to, to go into that lying on their back position. And you may have to do very little actively to get them there. Um, so just the next time or two that you are um, doing side lying feeding, um, take a little time to observe that. And, and if that's what you're seeing, then hopefully you can feel more confident that that will happen naturally, even if, if you're not observing it. Um, uh, because, you know, uh, again, the, the intention behind this is for you to also be able to fall asleep. So we're not always able to actively put the baby back on their back, um, but they generally do find their way there on their own. Um, if, if not, feel free to reach out to us and we can troubleshoot with you. We're happy to do that too. Um, we had another question, which was why specifically no sofa? Is it just because it's too soft? People could have a soft mattress on their bed. How is that safer? So we mentioned earlier that a soft mattress on the bed is not considered a safe sleep surface. Something with like a pillow top or a very squishy um, foam that you're really sinking into is not actually considered a safe sleep surface, even if it's a bed. Um, it needs to be a fairly firm surface. Um, and the um, part of the reason behind the sofa is not just that it is perhaps a softer surface, but also it has more of a tendency to have um, sort of crevices between cushions and between the cushions and the back of the sofa, the sides of the sofa. And what we're really trying to avoid is the baby getting into those um, crevices and unable to, 
to get back out again. Um, and the same is actually true um, if the baby is in bed with you. If you have a bed, for example, that is up against a wall, it can sometimes feel safer for you to be like inside close to the wall with the baby. Um, but, but that's not necessarily true if there is a crevice between the bed and the wall. You want to make sure that that is really filled in. Um, I, at one point, um, was sideline feeding with my, one of my older children in a bed in their room. There was a twin bed in their room and I would sometimes go in and feed them sideline at night. And we actually had a bed rail against the side of the bed that was closest to the wall. Um, so that there was something preventing them from rolling into, into that crevice. We weren't, it was fairly large because of the way that our baseboards are at my house, we weren't able to safely um, fill that in. So that was our, our solution. So um, that's, that's a big part of the reason why sofas are not considered safe because there's that added risk of various places that the baby can get, um, get into and not easily get back out of again. Um, I hope that's helpful. Um, all right, let's talk about the slide that's up here, which is ways to get sleep. You know, we want everyone to have optimized sleep. Um, and the first one is one that we all hear, sleep when the baby sleeps. Um, we're gonna we're gonna go through these and then we're gonna talk a little bit more about each one individually. Um, sleep when the baby sleeps, people tell you that. What does that actually mean? What does it look like? Um, arrange the most help you can whether that's help from family, friends, or professionals. And it doesn't always need to be help at night to help you get more sleep. Um, taking shifts at night with your partner or another adult is another thing we recommend. If you're using bottles for any of your feeding overnight, having them close by in a cooler near your bed. We've had uh, at least one client who had one of those tiny little college fridges. <laughs> that they kept bottles of, of um, pre-mixed formula in. Um, and this is something somebody asked about, which was diaper changes. Don't get up at night to change a diaper if it's only wet. Um, you know, we, we definitely don't want to keep a baby in a dirty diaper, but for the most part, it is perfectly okay. Um, if you've got a baby who's got some sensitive skin, you can use a bit of a barrier cream, but keeping them um, in there for a little bit longer, if it's just a wet diaper is another way to help you um, sleep a little bit longer. Um, so for going back to that number one, sleep when the baby sleeps, at least lie down. Even if you don't think you're gonna be able to sleep because it's the middle of the day, you're not a good sleeper during the day, just lie down. Make your room conducive to sleep. Um, use some room darkening shades if you um, can can do so, or perhaps uh, an eye mask if you know if the baby's not sleeping with you. Um, studies show that we underestimate whether we actually fall asleep or not. So um, even if you feel like you're not getting sleep, you may be <laughs> getting some substantial sleep. Um, Number two, arrange the most help you can for support around the house. All right. And that, I'm gonna, I'm sorry, I'm gonna just jump in just for a second. Yeah. We're gonna go over time just a little bit. So uh, apologize to folks, but hope you can stay with us for another um, five to 10 minutes. Um, and if not, you'll get the recording. So don't worry if you need to cut out early. Um, arrange the most help you can for support around the house from families, family, friends, professionals, doulas, night nannies, um, housekeepers or cleaners, laundry services, dog walkers. Um, they are, they're all ways for you to take things off your plate that then can be replaced with sleep or rest time. Um, all visitors are helpers. This is an important one. Anyone who comes to visit you should be considered a helper. You are not hosting in the newborn phase. Um, and anyone who comes to see you and the baby should be um, giving you some help uh, along the way. 
uh, and we'll talk about how we can how we can do that a little bit more in a second. Um, something that we really recommend a lot is taking shifts overnight with your partner or another adult. Um, and some people split the night into two shifts of about four hours, um, or some people alternate nights that they're on or off. Um, and if, if the non, or if the nursing parent is off, um, the non-nursing parent or adult might give them a bottle or might bring them in to side lying feed and then immediately take them back when the feed is over to take care of any, any other um, soothing or diapering that needs to be done. Um, it's okay for one adult to sleep in the same room as the baby and one adult to sleep in another room uh, maybe with some earplugs if you're not co-sleeping um, so that you can have a little bit more of a, a dedicated time that is just yours to dedicate to sleep. Um, often we find that someone in the family is a little bit more of a night owl so they can take the second shift um, and whoever is most comfortable falling asleep maybe a little earlier in the evening can take, take the first. Um, if someone other than the baby's um, parents is caring for the baby overnight, they should not co-sleep with the baby. That is not considered safe. So a doula, a night nanny, a relative or a friend, they can sleep, um, but they should be sleeping on a separate surface while the baby sleeps. Um, all right, we talked about those guys. Um, we recommend a refrigerator list for visitors. This is an easy way to let visitors know that they can be helpful to you while they're there. Um, and you can put things on that list, like how to run a load of laundry in your house. Um, if there are groceries that need to get picked up, um, you can let people know if you need help with things like washing dishes, taking out the trash or recycling, or, and this is everybody's favorite, holding the baby while the parent naps or takes a shower. Um, and you can just say, take a look at the list um, and see what you feel good about doing. Um, and that way you don't have to specifically ask people things. You don't have to think off the top of your head what needs doing. Um, other shortcuts that people make use of, we mentioned these in passing, but something like the wash fold, dry fold services at your local laundromat. Um, having a friend or a family member set up a meal train for you. Um, Mealtrain.com is great because people who are close by can sign up to bring meals to you. Folks who are a little further away can um, send you gift cards to local restaurants or even order out for you and have it delivered to you. Um, getting prepared meals from the supermarket, takeout from restaurants. Use paper plates for a little while <laughs> so that you have less dishes to do. Um, hire a dog walker so that that's one less task on your plate or ask a neighbor or a, a family member or a friend to, to walk your dog. Um, and let's see, so um, how can we try to get the baby to sleep a little more soundly in the crib? One, number one is swaddling. Um, and again, I mentioned earlier zipper swaddles. There are also Velcro swaddles. Um, Oftentimes people have trouble swaddling tightly enough with the blanket swaddles that they teach you at the hospital. If, if you think your baby doesn't like a swaddle, your newborn doesn't like a swaddle, it's probably actually not swaddled tightly enough. So if you have trouble doing that, um, a, a swaddle that zips or Velcros can be a really great one. Um, you can wait for um, the baby to be in a bit of a deeper, sleep state before putting them down. So observe your baby. Sometimes it can be a little, I take a, take a lot of observation to get a sense of what that deeper sleep state looks like and how long it lasts before the baby gets into a lighter stage, but you'll start to recognize, okay, this is where they're, they've really just kind of, I, I think of it as going boneless, you know, they, they suddenly feel five pounds heavier. Um, when you move the baby to the bassinet or the crib, leave a hand on them. That helps to neutralize their startle reflex. 
Give them a bit of a rock. Maybe you have a rocking cradle or a bassinet, but even if you don't, just giving their body a little bit of a rock in the, in the um, crib or the bassinet can um, help to create that little bobble motion where their head and their body are moving slightly at a different pace, which is very soothing to babies. So you can create that even if you don't have a rocking um, cradle or bassinet. Um, we have um, folks a lot of times who either have or are very interested in the SNU, um, which is the, the bassinet that does its own rocking and its own shushing. Um, and we get asked whether or not we recommend it. Um, we certainly work with families who use it. Um, some of them find it uh, effective for them, some don't. We do like to mention that it is a newer product and there is um, some concern among some physical therapists about whether it might be too restrictive to the baby. So again, we don't have enough research to really know at this point. Um, so we just like to lay that out there. Um, and what if the baby's waking up um, every hour at night to feed? We kind of talked a little bit about this earlier, but sometimes increasing the number of feeds during the daytime, as Ananda mentioned, um, can help. Um, and you can also make use of dream feeding. Um, many babies, most babies are willing when they're in a lighter sleep state to, to nurse or to take a bottle. Um, even if they are still asleep. Um, and so finding a time that is good for you, that's early enough in the evening or late enough in the morning um, that you are comfortable being awake, but the baby's asleep, you can try and feed them while they're still asleep to extend the amount of time until they'll need that next wakeful feeding. Um, all right, Ananda. Back to you. <laughs> okay, uh, we're almost done. This is our last slide. And we just wanted to take a, a quick look at the logistics um, of, of co-sleeping. That was Carrie was talking about the logistics of um, a baby sleeping in a crib. And we we did address some of these things already in the workshop. So we're almost done here. Um, <clears throat> oftentimes, if the, the parents are partnered, the nursing parent would sleep in, in the middle with the non-nursing parent on one side and the baby on the other side. Um, bed rails can be helpful. And there's lots of there's a you know variety of different kinds. Something like a mesh bed rail uh, would be helpful in case the baby gets closer to the edge of the bed, and that way that'll keep the baby in the bed uh, without being a surface, without being a material that blocks the baby's face. So again, look for those mesh bed rails. I like to say that a king size bed is a piece of baby equipment. So when people ask me during their pregnancies, what else do we need to get for the baby? Um, I say in a serious way, uh, you know, if you can budget for it, um, a king size bed would be great. Again, because the two thirds of us are gonna fall asleep in bed with our babies, whether we intend to or not. And a king size bed is gonna give much more room um, for that to be for that to be comfortable and manageable. Uh, the sidecar is the, the um, type of crib that attaches to the bed. Carrie mentioned um, the, the Arms Reach brand, um, but there's others as well. The mattress, some people place their mattresses on the floor. That's, that's the norm in certain cultures, but even in our culture where it's not necessarily the norm, Folks will just put their mattress on the floor so they don't have to think about uh, the possibility of the baby uh, falling off. And then finally, I'll say, um, ask a professional who is experienced with bed sharing to help you evaluate your sleep area. 
if you'd like some more reassurance, that could be a sleep consultant, it could be a lactation specialist, it could be a doula, it could be your doctor. And not all of those folks are going to be knowledgeable and experienced with bed sharing. So make sure that they are, you don't wanna ask somebody for, um, <clears throat> you know, to, to help you evaluate a co-sleeping or bed sharing situation if they're not actually experienced um, with, with co-sleeping. So we are going to finish up and I uh, just wanna say thank you for being here today. We're gonna to offer this workshop again throughout the year. We'll probably talk a little bit about different um, agenda items. So come back again, let others know about it. We'll, uh, again, we're gonna talk about those early sleep training programs. That's one thing, which ones are, for, are suitable for breastfeeding, uh, which ones are not. And we're gonna talk more about what is biologically normal infant sleep and infant feeding, because the more that all of us understand these topics, the more that we can feel calm um, about what's normal and find what's appropriate for our families. And um, thank you again. We will be here for a few more minutes to, uh, to answer some questions for you. And it's been great to, to be here with you today.